So on behalf of the organizers and volunteers, I'd like to welcome you all to WordCamp Vancouver 2023. I would also like to acknowledge that we're gathered today on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. Uh, the theme of WordCamp Vancouver this year is Connected Again. This is the first WordCamp Vancouver in four years, and as a WordPress community, we are thankful that we're finally able to reconnect to WordCamp. Uh, can I see a show of hands for people who are at their first WordCamp? Uh, so keep your hands raised for just a minute, and I want everyone who isn't raising their hand to look around and make a point of meeting at least one of the people raising their hands, because they're part of our WordPress community now, and we want them to feel welcome. WordCamps have a code of conduct to provide a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for everyone. This means being uh, considerate, respectful, and collaborative. If you have an issue or see an issue with a code of conduct, please talk to a volunteer or organizer. There will always be an organizer at the registration area throughout the day. Uh, coffee and tea can be found in front of the theater, this room, where the sponsor tables are. This is also where lunch is going to be served, which I believe starts at 12. Um, to connect to the Wi-Fi, you can use the UBC Visitor Network and just scroll down and agree to the terms and it'll let you in. Uh, we would also like to thank all of our sponsors this year, and in particular our gold sponsors. So those will be Affinity Bridge, Bluehost, GoDaddy, Jetpack, Simple Hosting, SiteGround, and Weglot. WordCamp is an all-volunteer conference. None of the speakers, volunteers, or organizers are paid to be here. So if you get the chance, thank them for their time and effort to make this possible. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our first speaker. This is uh, Flynn O'Connor. He's a web developer at UBC, and he's going to be talking about block themes today. And I think I'll hand it over to him. Uh, if anyone in here is thinking it's just for the opening remarks, you will not offend Flynn. If you're going to one of the other talks, just a heads up. So feel free to move around. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, can everyone hear me? All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming here on a somewhat rainy Saturday. It's going to be a good experience. Um, as you said, my name is Flynn O'Connor and I work for UBC. And today we're going to be going over some of the main parts of a block theme from a developer and agency perspective. Um, I currently work for UBC, but I have over 10 years of working with agencies. Uh, I ran a small developer co-op that would come in and provide WordPress specific developer experience for agencies that did not have full-time developers. So I've got a lot of experience working with designers and agencies and creating uh, custom WordPress sites. And so I want to bring some of that experience today and help us kind of look at new workflows and how we can use block themes to make WordPress themes in the future. I'd like to start by acknowledging that we are on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, which, as mentioned previously, is the Musqueam, Squamish, Stolo, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And so for the goal for today, there's three main things I want to do here. I want to give developers and content creators uh, new to block themes a better understanding of what a block theme is made of and what we can actually do in it. Uh, I want to explore the theme JSON file, which is a new part of WordPress theming, and it's a very powerful tool that people don't always understand what you can do with them. And then I want to expand a bit on what we can do with blocks in block patterns, and I also want to talk about style variations that are things that are a little bit under-talked about within theme development right now. I want to see how we can use these to kind of supercharge how we create new sites for our, our users and our clients. So I've used to, I've been using the same kind of workflow and I've seen a lot of agencies using the same kind of workflow for a long time where the client or the designer provides you with a design brief or design files, whether it's Photoshop or Figma, and you kind of review those files and then uh, developers typically have to think about the designs uh, and interpret them in a way where we can use those designs and control them within the CMS. And so we interpret them and we think about how we can create new custom meta fields, use the WordPress content area, how we can basically 
allow people with less tech savvy understandings create and manage the content that the design has laid out for them. Now this can be with just standard WordPress and the content editor, but oftentimes uh, you'll be using things like advanced custom fields, Divi, Elementor, a lot of these different page builders. And this has been something that has been fairly prominent in our industry for over a decade. It's just based on how each agency's technical acumen is, they have different ways of interpreting it and going with it. And a very common way of looking at it is we often focus on like the pages. We look at page templates and how to create major components of a website. So oftentimes when we're building a site, we think about the home page, an about page, a contact page, and maybe other elements of, a, of the site that is important to our clients. Sometimes it's team, sometimes it's uh, major products they use or services, things like that. And all of which are things that we want the users and our clients to control. And we think about these as a whole, and we never actually think about how we can break these up. And what happened in 2019, 2020 is WordPress started to shift. We started to change how things were going. And it started with the Gutenberg editor that was originally just for content. We started looking at the block editor and and as we've evolved, WordPress in 6.2 and 6.3 has expanded that editor out. So it's not just the content. We're now able to control and manage everything on the site within this editor experience. And with that, we have to start rethinking what a theme is and what it's controlling and what we are giving our clients the ability to change and edit. So as before, it was a lot of what we were theming and building were PHP files with some CSS and JavaScript for visual changes and dynamic experience. But now with a lot of the new tools being brought in, there's many different things that we wouldn't normally think about in our workflow that can be very powerful and helpful for us in building out our themes. Our themes are not just PHP files. There are these configuration files like theme JSON that I'll get into later. It's the blocks and how we style the blocks and we start exploring block templates after this. And it's just a lot of different um, tools that allow us to provide the starting point for our users, but then the themes will then be not necessarily what they end up with. With the Gutenberg and the site editor now, people can change so much that what you give them and what ends up launching might be something completely different based on what our client's comfortability is with editing their content. So to start off, we'll talk about block templates. And with block templates, uh, there's a bit of a shift where if you look at some of the more newer themes, uh, a lot of the files are not actually PHP files. A lot of the files are now HTML files. Uh, they, they copy the template hierarchy of naming, but the syntax and what we write in there is very different. And it's important to remember that these templates, when we create them, can and will likely be overridden by the user. So like I said, we're just providing them a starting point. So for those who maybe have not had a ton of experience with the block editor, I just want to kind of give people a quick rundown here about what the basic block grammar is. And the block grammar is something that you can see already in the Gutenberg editor if you go into code view. And so we have um, what we call uh, HTML comments that are used to store what's referred to as JSON objects. And so we have here, any block in WordPress will always start with this HTML comment and then a WP comma or colon and then the name of the block. And so oftentimes if you start working with block themes, you'll start to see that the, some of these blocks are simply a single line comment with just a name and calling that will then bring in information. It's very similar to how we used to have PHP functions. Like there is a block for the post title, which is very simple, uh, similar to the PHP function where it's just the title. The Gutenberg block editor has one where it's WP colon block uh, post title. 
for some blocks, we will have content wrapped in them. And so the HTML comments act almost like divs where they kind of wrap around the content you're, you're, you're adding. So you have the opening of the block here, for example, then you have the content, and then you have the closing where it's just a similar forward slash and then the name of the block. So it's very simple and it's consistent within the Gutenberg editor as well as in our theme files. So here's an example of like a really basic theme could look like. Much like original kind of what I've heard to as classic themes, themes need really just two pieces. They need a style.css uh, file and that file, more, more important than the styles itself, is the meta information at the top. Those comments are what is used to help WordPress understand the information about that theme. And then after that, it needs a single index file. But it's not an index.php, it's an index.html found within the templates directory. And it's important to understand that the templates directory is where we store all of our block templates. WordPress works in a way where um, if you don't have a functions.php file, if you have that template directory, WordPress just assumes you're a block editor. It does a lot of things for you automatically. The thing is, if we wanted just a simple structure, um, I could have just made this a lightning talk and be done in like seven minutes. But what we really need is we want to explore how our templates look like and what we can add to them. And our templates can uh, follow the same basic structure of what we're used to. We're able to create an index file .html. We're able to create a page .html. Every, if you're familiar with the template hierarchy within WordPress, most of those root level templates can be created in HTML much like we used to do in PHP. And as you can see here is my examples. Um, can we see the button here? Yeah. So this is an example of what the, the index.html page would look like when it's when uh, a very basic version. And if you've used the Gutenberg editor before, it's a lot of this is exactly what you would create in a post or page using the Gutenberg editor. What you might not see in there is this part up here, which is a WP template part. So this is a block that we can actually use to pull in other files, just like we would do with get template part in our PHP calls with classic themes. Template parts share a similar structure to what we have before, where we have uh, the slug, and the slug needs to kind of match the name of the file. As you can see here, you would have a parts directory, and in that parts directory, that is where you would keep all of your template parts. And the slug needs to match the name of the file here, so I'd have a header.html, and I could have a footer.html. And within those, those are simply just um, pieces of code that we're going to be reusing across different templates. So much like we would do in our classic themes, we'd call header and footer consistently. But one thing you won't see in here is you won't see um, sidebars anymore. Because one thing that's important to note is that with the block editor, we can now add content in very many different ways. So we no longer need widget areas the same way we did in the past. Instead, we can just add different block components in different areas of our site. And within our main templates, we can create our header, our footer, and we can have a secondary area, and then people can add whatever blocks they want in there. They are not limited to just widgets anymore. So one thing I want to touch on is that one of the major additions that we as developers are not maybe fully exploring yet, but I highly encourage you to do so, is the site editor which was added in WordPress 6.2 has dramatically change what we and also less code savvy users can work with. The site editor allows us to edit any of the templates in our theme. And when it does this, it does it in a non-destructive way. What we're able to do is give our users the ability to customize the templates we give them. And then rather than overwriting our files, it saves those into the database. Now these are, the site editor will change 
templates that are not associated to specific posts or pages. There's also something buried within the UI for this that's called the template editor. And we're able to create custom templates for individual posts and pages. So if you have a unique layout for, say, your about page, you can create a custom template for that and assign it into an individual page. And that page template will overwrite anything else associated with it. And the template editor will allow your users to change and alter that. And it's important to remember, too, that these are all saved in the database. So your theme files will always be a starting point. So if they mess it up, all they have to do is erase their changes, and it goes back to the original theme file that you provided for them. So there's a lot more of a allowance of sharing of the content. Whereas before with classic themes, the PHP files were something that our users were never able to really touch unless, God forbid, we gave them access to the theme editor of options. But more often now, we can give them a starting point and they can control it in the exact same way that we are building our block theme templates. So while our block templates will provide a lot of structure and control over the larger pages, we still need to consider the blocks themselves. We can't rely on the same blocks again and again. The variation in blocks is what allows us as theme developers and designers the ability to provide consistent content blocks with enough visual diversity to allow the people we empower to create dynamic websites. This allows us to maintain a predictable flow of content. Based on the unique needs of your projects, you might have to alter blocks in several different ways. The three main ones I would I would, I'm going to talk about today are block styles, block variations, and I'm referring to extending blocks, but what this is really is is just adding custom attributes to our blocks. Each of these has their own pros or cons based on your user need as well as the kind of level of development complexity you want to get into. So block styles are a simple way to define different visual representations of the same block. A good example of this that comes with core is that when you use the button block, there is a standard button, but there's also a rounded. And this allows you to do different visual representations of similar content. It's important to understand, though, that with these block styles, not every style is going to, or sorry, let me rephrase that. One style is applicable to each block at any one time. You can't have one block having two different styles at the same time. The other thing that's important to understand is that within the current Gutenberg experience in the admin UI, if you create too many custom block styles, the UI can be very, very cluttered. So if you need to create multiple block styles, it might be something where you consider different, more complex options for your content editors. So block variations allow theme editors the ability to signify to users when something is similar but is using things just a little bit differently. So we might have a block that works in certain contexts, but we also want to provide a different variation, and we don't want it to be rested in the original block. We want to separate it out as a completely different option within the theme editor's admin screen. And so when we create a custom block variation, we can take our existing block, relabel it, but also redefine what its starting point is. We can, we can define what content is in it if it supports inner content. A good example of this is media text block. So in one of the sites I work on, sometimes people are using the media text block for very simple things. But in a couple of instances, they're using the media and text block as a spotlight area for their content. So I created a block variation that would allow them to select that, and it would already have predefined title and description. And all they have to do is change that content and add an image. So it gives them a unique version of that block that is significantly different in its function, but works with the same admin interface. Another example of this is the embed block. So typically with the embed block, we use that for embedding third-party content. But more often than not, we're using the YouTube block, we're using the Twitter slash X block, we're using one of the other ones. But all of those different embed blocks are simply block variations of the original core embed block. 
if you need more variation and the variation is not fully related, for instance, you have different colors but also different border styles or background styles, and it's something that is not really achievable with the core UI functions, you might want to consider looking at custom block attributes. With the custom block attributes, you can have multiple different combinations of styles and settings that you would not be able to do with a block with a basic block style. Because say for this example here on the screen, I have three different pattern colors and the pattern shape might be dots, dashes, or something else. If you were to combine every single different variation of that, that would be like six to seven different variations. So for block styles, you would just have this huge list of different options that would be very convoluted. Whereas with extending the attributes here, you can use this to use the combinations much more easily for your users. If you want to get a bit more advanced with this, there's also going to be a really good talk later on today about slot fill. I highly recommend you check that one out. So while the way we handle templates may look different in the block theme, it still holds many similarities to the classic way in, in how we do theming. But theme JSON is where we begin to enter new waters and, and how you previously handle aspects of the theme changes dramatically in here. One of the main things that WordPress is working to shift towards is more of controlling theme through configuration. And theme JSON is the keystone of that change in theming. The theme JSON has two major sections that we'll talk about today. It has the settings, which defines the controls within our blocks and it creates new options. We can change a number of different settings. I'll go into that shortly. And then styles, which we can use to define the fonts, the colors of not just the blocks themselves, but elements within the theme. So within the theme JSON settings, we are able to define all the different controls available to content editors within the admin. We can remove certain settings, we can remove certain controls, or we can add certain controls. And we can define the content of our site. This is an important thing that people don't actually understand, is that previously we would define our, our layout in our CSS, but WordPress now offers the ability to define the width of your content. And this is important because when editor or when creators are using your sites, they might have different alignment options where they want to go wide or full width and other things like that. And by defining that in our theme JSON, we are automatically giving the UI admin an understanding of this is the constraints we want to work within. We can also do things like change um, how many palettes we use for our colors and what kind of different options. And it's important to understand that with theme JSON, this is a living file and that with every iteration of WordPress, there are things that are being added to theme JSON. Before developers would look at a design and decide what kind of custom fields and what other um, ways they might be able to achieve the designs, and how they would want to add content to allow the site to, to be presented like the designs. But now we need to start considering more how can the blocks that WordPress provides us achieve the designs that we're working in? And how can those blocks be used in a consistent way to match the designs, but also give the users and our clients more flexibility to do anything they want beyond the designs? The designs in our files should be a starting point for our users and our clients. And if we build thinking about this from the starting point, we will allow people much more control and hopefully a much more positive experience assuming they know how to use a block editor. <laughs> so an example of what we can do with uh, theme JSON settings here is I'm taking the core heading file here. And I'm saying, OK, I want to change this. I want, uh, so I work for UBC. And UBC has a very particular brand color scheme they have. And we're very strict on it. So if people use the wrong blue, if it's not the UBC blue, we let them know. So an example of what we might want to do in our theme JSON file is we might want to set it up so that our heading files, we don't want to allow them, if you've used the editor file or the the Gutenberg editor, you'll know that there are certain color pickers. So we don't want to allow them the free wheel color picker where they can choose any color. 
And so here I'm just setting that to false. I'm saying custom colors, get that out of here. And then I'm saying default palette. So WordPress comes with a default palette. I'm saying I want that out of here as well. And instead what I'm doing is I'm adding a setting here and I'm saying here's the palette I want to use. And then I would add the custom colors that match the brand I'm working with. So that way when our users are making pages and they're adding headings, they would only ever have the option of using our brand colors and not going too crazy with their colors. This can also be very important if your site has a very unique uh, style and you want to make sure that your text maintains accessibility constraints because we don't want people to change colors if they don't understand the idea of contrast issues and accessibility. So one thing that I think is maybe not fully considered yet, and I'm really hoping to champion this more in the future, is whenever we create a new setting for a color, a gradient, font size, spacing, other things like that, in the theme JSON file, WordPress is taking those, those values and they will parse them and create CSS variables on both the front end and the back end. And not only are we doing that within our core settings, we are also given the option in the settings area of theme JSON to add custom values of any type that we can use in CSS. So this is an example of it where I've created custom UBC font sizes and colors. And then um, I pass in the theme JSON. And if you then inspect your site, you will see that WordPress generates these custom CSS variables. By default, WordPress will always have the CSS variables with like hyphen hyphen WP. And then the second section defines the context of it. And then the final area would be the actual value of the what we refer to as the slug of these custom areas. So these are really important because when we create these CSS variables, we're able to take them and then reuse them throughout our theme JSON. So if you've defined a color palette and it creates these CSS variables, you can then take those if you know where you want to apply them and put them all into your theme JSON stylings and settings and make it very consistent in a way where all you have to do if you want to say change your color down the road, you change that color in one place, it alters that CSS variable and that change is reflected throughout your theme JSON and thus your theme. It's very powerful, but it takes a bit of a change in how we think about how we style and develop. So with the theme JSON styles, we are looking to define the styling of any block within Gutenberg. And this is not the same as what the user creates with their, when they're altering the styles. We're defining the starting styles for our blocks. But not only the blocks, the theme JSON file also allows us to divine, define certain element styles. We can define all of the headings, links, uh, I think, what else was there? Uh, pseudo selectors, buttons, and uh, with the pseudo selectors, we can change uh, hover and active and things like that. So we're able to define these styles within this theme JSON and make it consistent because in some cases, some of these links will not necessarily be managed within our block editor. For example, when we add theme or when we add menus, the links in there are not going to be necessarily controlled the same way that regular button links would be in our theme editor. So this allows us to style them consistently across all iterations of this example. So when we're utilizing theme JSON to handle controlling our styles of blocks, we can take a large leap from a different mindset from where we would build pages and posts with a PSD or a Figma file and then style and style.css. This is what I was talking about earlier and this is an example of it where we can now map out these styles in a much more controlled and contained way. So here's an example of me using that uh, CSS variable in my elements where I know every H1 across my site, I want it to be a custom font size consistently. And this is really important because this allows us to maintain certain kind of flow of sizing and content consistency that will allow us to be a better experience for the people visiting these sites. So I'm going to switch over now to uh, global style variations. And this is very related because if you look in, say, uh, the 2023 theme, you'll see that there is a directory called styles. 
And in there is several different JSON files. And these are referred to as global style variations. And what global style variations are, are essentially extra themed JSON files. But what they're meant to do is they're meant to give separate variations of your site. And they can override your original theme JSON file in any number of ways. You can kind of redefine the color palettes. You can change the font sizes. You can enable or disable different um, settings that you've added in the core one. This gives you a way to create a theme that can have multiple different versions of that theme. This is especially helpful for people that are building, say, a multi-site that are going to have different iterations of the site, but using the same theme, and they want to provide people with a much faster starting point to making their site look unique, but still using the same core block structure. Any settings and styles that are not specifically overwritten are inherited from the parent theme JSON, and anything that is not in our, in our themes JSON file will actually be affected by the theme JSON file that is in core WordPress. Your theme uh, will need a styles directory, as I showed here. And then what we do is we just um, add the name of our we add the name of our style variant, and then in here, it can have as much or as little as you want to kind of customize the look and feel. So thank you for bearing with me. We're almost done. I just want to talk a little bit more about uh, block patterns. So we're going back to the blocks. With block patterns, if you've used them before, you understand they're just a series of blocks that we use to kind of give people a starting point. And it's really helpful for our clients, especially when we know that uh, our clients are going to be doing the same thing again and again and again. So an example would be like landing pages. We can create custom landing pages that allows them to kind of turbocharge their content creation workflow by having everything laid out and they can then edit them however they want to. We can also use block patterns uh, and assign them strictly to uh, custom post types. So for example, say you have uh, a team or a uh, a uh, case study uh, post type. You can create a block pattern that would be the whole layout for that page, and all people have to do is just enter the content in however they see. And the nice thing is, it's laid out how it's going to look on the front end, whereas in previous classic themes, if you're using things like uh, Divi Builder or using ACF with custom grouping and whatnot, you might get a general sense of what you're looking at, but it's not going to match the layout of what you're going to put out there in the end. And with the block patterns and the block themes, you have a better understanding of what it's going to look like on the front end and the back end. So block patterns can be registered within a functions file. Yes, block themes can use function files, and they can use PHP. In fact, block pattern template files have to be PHP. And this is because any block pattern has to register using PHP comments so that, they, uh, that WordPress can understand that this is a block theme, or a block pattern, I should say, and it has certain attributes that needs to be used. The two core ones we need is the title. This is the description that people are going to see when they're using it in the editor. And then the slug. And the slug is important because that is going to be what is used uh, in the editor. But also, we can call these patterns in our themes. And similar to how I showed you previously where we did WP colon and then a, a block, this slug is basically creating a new block name that you could call in your templates. You can also create. Um, block patterns and define them uh, with a category which is referred to as post content. And what this does, it tells you, it tells uh, WordPress, this block pattern is going to take over the entire page. So if you've ever seen a site where when you create a new poster page and a pop-up shows up and says, which template do you want to use? That is what that block pattern is doing. So you can create these and give your users the option to select different patterns to start with. But keep in mind that not everyone likes this kind of very abrupt pop-up. So you can disable that in your theme functions file as well. So thank you very much. We've gone through a ton at a really kind of like high level kind of breeze over things. Uh, block themes are so, so powerful, but they're not for everyone. We have, like I said, been using a very common workflow for a decade, and it can be very tough to shift from 
the old way of doing things to a new way of doing things. And there sometimes needs to be a business case for it. But I can honestly say, having worked with block themes now for about two years, that they are such a better experience for our clients when they're done right. And when we are training our clients how to use them and the power of what they're doing. We give them more variety, we give them more control, and we can still give them some kind of guide rails and keep them kind of within the sandbox and not going crazy with their own styles. I know that some people get terrified of giving clients all the control in the world because sometimes people just do whatever they want with it and that's not what we want. But when block themes are done right, they are such a great experience. And they don't have to be done today. If you don't use them today, that's fine. If you have something that works for you, keep doing that. But I highly encourage you to continue to explore this and look at this. I'm gonna tweet out or X out my uh, slides. And so I have a bunch of references in here that I highly encourage you to look at. Explore it, um, and if you want to do it, there is actually a, a plugin here called the Create Block Theme Plugin. And you can install that on a WordPress site and just go into the site editor, create a bunch of templates in the editor, and then using that block uh, theme plugin, just click export. And without touching a single line of code, you will have created a block theme through your editor. So there is a lot of amazing options here that we have just begun to understand and we want to help people understand and explore them more in the future. Thank you very much. So we are going to be moving on to the Q&A section now. So if anybody has a question, uh, I can just ask you guys to raise your hands and I will come over to you with the mic and you can ask your question and uh, Flynn will be able to respond to you. Hi, two quick questions. One, it looks like like with the index.html, is there anything in that beside comments? Like, would you actually do any content in it, or is it just happens to be named.html? Uh, so the question is, is the index.html having anything other than the WordPress comments? And the answer is yes. Uh, you can treat it like a standard HTML file. So uh, because of the size of my slides, I couldn't expand on it. But you can actually wrap your WordPress blocks in standard HTML. So you can do like divs. You can do like main, footer, and other elements like that. You can put in content. You can put in uh, HTML tags, anything like that. I wouldn't encourage you to put in content content unless you absolutely do not want them to edit it, which then, yeah, for sure. But yes, you can put in anything in HTML that you would normally put in an HTML file. Very good. And then the second question, you right at the end, you talked about a, a black theme uh, creation plugin. Yes. Can you open block themes and edit them with that? Or is it only, for, is it is it read-write or is it write-only? So that actually, yes, it can do that. So if you have a block theme already installed and you open that plugin, it will allow you to edit it. But keep in mind, you don't need that plugin to edit the block theme. But what that does is any edits you make in that theme that's already pre-existing, the, that plugin will allow you to export the, that changed theme as a brand new theme or as a child theme or overwrite the, the existing one. If you install it and you look, there's actually several different options it will give you for that. Thank you. The reason I was, con I, I'm terrified, like people are worried about letting their clients edit their content. Mm -hmm. I'm really afraid of letting my clients edit JSON files. Oh yeah, no, I would recommend that. I don't even want to learn JSON <laughs> syntax. So anyway, thank you very much. You're welcome. Yes. I'm just curious about, um, you're talking about custom styling in the blocks, mm -hmm. um, how that would fit with like SAS mm. compiler, or does it just replace that completely in, in a theme development? That's a challenge that I'm currently working with as well too in uh, our work. I kind of see it as replacing it because honestly, CSS is now at a place where we almost don't need SAS anymore. We already have variables. Um, it sounds like nesting is coming into native CSS fairly soon too. I think the only thing SAS still has that I don't think CSS is gonna fully get is mixins. 
So it, I think it will change it in a lot of ways. However, um, you can still combine it into your SAS files by harnessing the CSS variables that it generates. So if you use those CSS variables, you could then use that in your SAS file still. It just, you have to kind of think about how do I map that into my SAS workflow. Yeah. Yes. Um, with the JSON theme variations, mm -hmm. um, so is that basically kind of like creating a child theme? Ah. It's, it's, it's kind of in this weird gray area where it's not kind of a child theme. It's a little bit more limited because child themes can actually do more than what you do in just the global style variations. But it's, it's, it's kind of halfway there. Like it is in a lot of ways. It is creating, it's inheriting everything that's in the main site and all you're doing is you're changing some of the settings and the styles. So you can only really change what's available within the theme.json. Correct. And if you wanted to change more than that, you still need a different theme. You would do a child theme, yes. Yeah. Because, yeah. like, um, and there, in some cases, too, like, if you have a, a third party theme, you can't add a global style variation into that theme because if you update it, your variation is gone. So, a good example of when you need to use a child theme is the 2023 theme disables the drop cap option in the paragraph tag. And so in some cases, when people actually need the drop cap, they create a child theme, which is just a theme JSON file re-enabling that setting. And that's it. Yes. Hi. Uh, a variation on, on the question here. In terms of like a development workflow, uh, are there any tools or a, a direction where you can selectively export a, a a uh, template change to the file system. So I, I'm thinking of like, I don't want to do the whole theme. I've already got the theme out there. I just, I've made a change now. I want to export that. Yeah, because there's a real challenge right now with version control and these kind of block theme editing. That's still a, a real kind of challenge in some development workflows. I can't recall off the top of my head if the block theme plugin allows you to export specific files. You might have to export the entire thing and just do a diff comparison. But yeah, that's, that's the one challenge right now that people have voiced is that uh, block themes are great, but when you start incorporating people using the site editor and then trying to put their changes into version control, there hasn't been a kind of agreed upon workflow for how to do that consistently yet. But that's kind of like hopefully something we'll see in the near future. Thank you. Yes. Not right behind you. <laughs> so speaking about version control, is there um, a revision control on the theme editor? Like so if so uh, a person goes in, makes a change, as, as a developer can go back and see what changes have been made Ooh, and, and kind of cherry pick those as well. <laughs> so unfortunately, I have, version, I have uh, revisions turned off on my site, so I haven't actually checked if they can do that in the site editor. I will double check that and, and try to get back to you if I can, but I'm not sure if it actually supports that right now. Yes, John. Does this work okay alongside traditional template themes? If I have an existing template theme, can I convert part of it to to um, to this, or can I extend it with with some of this? Technology. Yeah, so the question is, can you extend a classic uh, type theme with a lot of this functionality? And the answer is yes. Uh, the, 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 there's functionality that you can add to classic themes where you add support for site editor, or you add support for certain other elements of this. And then you can have the templates with HTML, and you can have the template parts using the uh, HTML, and you can even have a theme JSON file. They're, they're referred to as kind of like a hybrid theme themes, so you can have a bit of both in there. It just sometimes can run into conflicts with uh, certain stylistic aspects from what I've seen. But yes, it's definitely possible. It's something they're working to make sure that people, if they're not able to completely commit to a new block theme style, they can add a lot of that same control within their theme, but still have more of the classic templating that you, you're currently using. Yes. Suggestions for starter theme? Uh, so a suggestion for starter theme, uh, I would say 
the 2023 theme if you're looking for something that already has some opinionated stuff. But outside of that, honestly, if you want to do your own starter theme, I would say install the plugin that I mentioned and just start building some templates that you know you need and go from there. Uh, there's actually also a, um, a website here called Full Site Editing. And the Full Site Editing website has a link to a uh, starter theme block, uh, starter block theme generator. So you can go there and generate one from there as well too that will have a structure that they recommend. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Um, one of the things that I found a little bit frustrating with, oh, one of the things I found frustrating with the block themes is um, how it handles responsive mm -hmm. um, movement to the blocks and such. What is the best way to implement um, any specific responsive design that you want to that you want to do? Is there any blocks in particular you're talking about, or just in general how things stack on responsive? Um, pretty much how things stack, um, spacing between elements. Yeah. Um, I can't think of anything specifically. Yeah. yeah. So um, there are spacing settings within uh, the theme JSON file, and there's two areas where uh, the theme JSON supports a certain amount of flexibility. Font size and spacing both uh, support fluid movement. Like uh, you can do fluid typography in uh, the theme JSON font sizes, and then in the spacing section, which controls spacing between and in blocks, that can use uh, a function, I believe it's called clamp, where you can kind of specify a min max, and it can then provide you uh, different spacing depending on the size. So that would be two areas where I'd maybe suggest. I know there's still some challenges with certain blocks. Like I know I've had some challenges in the past with some blocks like the median text where we don't always want the image to stack on the top. There's still some challenges there, but I would say working with font sizing and spacing is a good place to start for helping your site be more friendly on mobile. Um, how about accessibility in these block themes? Ah. How does that factor in? So uh, with accessibility, it's block themes are a bit more interesting because they rely more on the clients and our users to understand proper accessibility when it comes to contrast, but also the order of uh, elements, making sure your H1s and your H2s and all that kind of stuff. And we as theme developers can specify font sizes to start with that are actually of a proper size so people with reading disabilities can read them at a right size. When it comes to screen readers, uh, I believe that a lot of the blocks are fairly accessible now. Um, I don't know if we have things like the skip to menu, which we used to have in underscores and things like that in block themes yet. I think it's something that is still being worked on. I'm fairly certain there's an accessibility team, but uh, yeah, I think it's it's become more of a uh, more of a conversation where we have with both developers, but also the clients, and understanding that when you're creating content, make sure you do it in a way where you're using proper color contrast, you're using proper sizing, and um, yeah, just being aware of what is needed for accessibility. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day.